started now. Um, on behalf of the IEEE GRSS, that's the Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society, this is the GSIS, the Geoscience and Space Borne Imaging Spectroscopy Technical Committee. Um, my name is Amanda O'Connor. I'm with L3 Harris Geospatial. I'm, John, I'm joined by Yamamoto Hirokazu, who is the chair of this technical committee, as well as Jennifer Adams, um, who is also co-chair on this committee, and she's used, uh, recently uh, moved to the University of Zurich. Is that correct, Jennifer? Yeah, absolutely correct. I know, I know, Jen. From Hi, Ron. Chime, and we have good connection with UZH. Wonderful. And we also have Fairuz Srambuli um, from IEEE, who is helping us host this webinar today. So thank you so much um, for your help in, in putting this together. Um, today, we have the honor of learning from Dr. Rob Green um, of NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, he's going to be sharing his experience with methane and CO2 monitoring with the AVERIS instrument. Um, as some housekeeping, this session is being recorded. Please mute yourselves. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat and have some time for questions at the end. Um, if we don't get to your question, we will be recording them and hopefully we can get back to you as soon as possible. Um, Dr. Green has been involved in the hyperspectral community for an extensive period of, of time, been involved with many missions out of JPL, including the Earth's Surface Mineral Dust Source Instigation, EMIT, um, that was selected to fly on the International Space Station. He's been the principal um, and is the principal investigator of Avaris and Avaris Next Gen, which has been shown to be a powerful, powerful tools for detecting and measuring greenhouse gas point source emissions. Um, Dr. Green was the instrument science for, scientist for the NASA Discovery Moon Mineralogical uh, Mineralogy Mapper, M3, that discovered water and hydroxyl um, compounds on the illuminated surface. He is a, co he is a science co-investigator and instrument scientist on the mapping imaging spectrometer for Europa, MISE, and that will address questions related to the ability of the, for the NASA Europa Clipper mission. Um, Dr. Green has been involved um, with the Laboratory for Micro Devices um, and a partner for the Carbon Mapper Instrument. For more than 25 years, his research has focused on advanced imaging spectrometer instrumentation. Um, so just again, please uh, mute yourself so we can learn from Dr. Green today. Um, thank you so much, Rob, for joining us, and I will turn it over to you. All right, I will try to share. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Let me just see the, so am I sharing at the moment or? Zoom is sharing your screen. So it says I'm sharing, so I should, we'll just figure this out. Um, there you is go. that visible? Yep. All right. You got it. And then full mode and display settings. Okay, again, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, uh, I, I will, focus a little, you know, I'll, I'll try to cover the topic carbon dioxide and methane, but uh, I went back and looked through, uh, you know, my historical presentations and, and articles and uh, pulled these things together. But again, the field is much bigger than just me, though I was uh, certainly involved uh, early on in some of these topics. And again, I want to honor the imaging spectroscopy community, and I've got some charts from them here as well. And then I'm glad to talk about other topics. There should be time for questions as well as I've applied imaging spectroscopy to a range of uh, questions uh, on Earth and elsewhere in the solar system. So um, what we're talking about is a class of instruments which measure a spectrum for every point in the image. And I was very fortunate to be in graduate school when technology allowed this class of instrument to be conceived and, and, and basically invented. Um, prior to that, there really had only been point spectrometers and largely the, the astronomers had used those with telescopes, of course, to uh, understand our universe. Uh, but uh, when I was in graduate school in the early 80s, it became clear we could build instruments that could do these two things, collect images, but measure a whole spectrum rather than just a few wavelengths with a band pass. And I've been fortunate um, to stick with that for my entire career now, more than 30 years. Um, I want to point out it's 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 a good measurement technology. It leads to uh, uh, new observables for new science. And again, I've been fortunate to be involved in, in a range of uh, 
uh, sort of science discoveries or advances um, across the solar system. Uh, some of them more recently, again, related to, uh, to methane and carbon dioxide, highlighting uh, Riley's paper in Nature in 2019. Again, reminding why, why would you want to measure a spectrum? Well, on Earth, it, it makes a lot of sense. There's just a lot of molecules, particles, structures that interact with light in this range, uh, 400 to 2500. Normally, I'm talking about, of course, the spectrum extends in both directions. But this is a rich range um, for uh, you know, processes that create spectral uh, signatures um, for the terrestrial surface, for aquatic environments uh, and, and for the atmosphere. But it was also realized right on at JPL, which largely was focused on planetary uh, when I arrived there, that uh, the solar system is rich with uh, spectral signatures for science and discovery. So um, it's one of those very fortunate tools, spectroscopy, I think it's perhaps one of the most important analytical tools for understanding composition and processes. Uh, and it extends, as I'm trying to highlight here, um, in the Earth system, but throughout the solar system, and of course, effectively throughout the universe with the uh, astronomy community. Um, but coming back to home and the topic um, of this, uh, uh, this webinar, um, the Earth system is uh, rich with signatures, but one of the big ones is the atmosphere. And so looking in this range, 400 to 2,500 nanometers, um, here's a high resolution Montran transmit spectrum showing the absorption of different gases. Uh, first and foremost is water vapor um, it's because of its uh, molecular structure, it really interacts with energy and absorbs um, uh, in different levels across this whole spectrum. Of course, it finds structure uh, with which is the nature of gas absorption. So you're seeing some of that here. So we've got water vapor all across here. And these are overtones from the fundamental, um, the three fundamentals, one at uh, uh, 2800 uh, as well. Um, but in addition, uh, we can see oxygen. Uh, there's the, uh, there's one of the oxygens. There's the uh, 760 that gets used by OCO. There's carbon dioxide here and here. And there's methane. It's lost in a lot of these water lines, but there's a methane absorption here. There's also another methane, weak methane absorption here, which I haven't called out. And of course, there's atmospheric scattering. So uh, there is leverage. For these, in, in the early days, it was considered noise. It was obscuring with, with imaging spectrometers. We wanted to look at the surface, but we had to look at the atmosphere. So we had to figure out how to compensate for the atmosphere. So part of figuring out how to compensate for something is measuring it so that you can suppress it. So that's sort of how I got in this uh, in this field of thinking about the atmosphere. My my degree at the time was uh, in uh, in geology, uh, looking at general spectral signatures. Um, and what drew me uh, to JPL and imaging spectroscopy was this. Uh, this is the first imaging spectrometer. It was proposed on internal money at JPL um, in 1979. And it was built and it first flew in 1982 and is the first uh, of this class of digital imaging spectrometers. It used a 32 by 32 mercury cadmium telluride array from Rockwell Scientific, now Teledyne. So it's not a megapixel, it's a K pixel detector array. Um, again, it flew in, in 1982 and early on made discoveries, not of new materials that we didn't know about, but the occurrence of materials in places we didn't know they existed. So here was the uh, the discovery of the occurrence of the, the mineral budding tonight uh, at Cooperite, Nevada, which again sort of cemented the, the initial evidence for the power of this approach. That if you have all spectrum, not only can you measure and characterize things you are know uh, are present, but you can uh, um, look for. Uh, Things that that uh, that you don't know are there, and and quantitatively show that they're present. So uh, that was the early imaging spectrometer work. Um, based on AIS, uh, JPL proposed to build Avris in 1983, um, and that's about when I met Greg Vane at, at my university at Stanford at the time, and. Uh, 
decided I, I was already working on uh, with a point spectrometer and very interested in, in this new technology. So that, that drew my focus towards trying to get wrapped up with JPL and what they were doing. Um, so Avaris first flew in 1986. Um, it flew last year. It's planned to fly this year. So it'll be one of the longest flying instruments airborne on record, I think. We're coming up on 35 years. Uh, and I expect to retire when it retires. But anyway, it's been very successful. Um, if you just put Avaris, which is a, a wonderfully unique acronym, uh, fortuitously, um, into Google search, Google Scholar, you'll find the 30,000 results. And most of them are really related to Avaris because no one else has decided to use that, that acronym. Um, it's quite a large instrument. It uh, flies mostly on an ER2 at 65,000 or 20 kilometers altitude. But you'll see some data sets here collected at lower altitudes and different platforms. But again, it fulfills that vision of measuring a spectrum for every point in an image. This is the Southern Bay area, about 11 kilometers swath, and a full spectrum from 400 to 2,500 nanometers. These are the two strong water bands um, shown over here. Um, so moving on again, the atmosphere immediately became clear with the measurement of Avaris. Uh, beyond the spectral range of AS, which was much more limited with only 32 spectral bands originally. Um, that was a bit of a trick to make that 64, but I'll leave it at that. Avaris measured this whole range, and again, the atmosphere was fully in play. Here, the, I've convolved the atmosphere to the nominal 10 nanometer bands of Avaris, so you can see those different uh, elements, and it's a very different story than at the time, Lanth at Thematic Mapper was the uh, remote sensing tool of choice. And I've been a long history explaining why it might be better uh, to measure the whole spectrum if you could instead of a few wavelengths, uh, but we won't go into that here. So uh, the atmosphere was in play. We needed to understand it, to see the surface, to try to suppress it. So I got involved very early. Um, and again, driving home the point, water vapor is the number one element, and we'll go from water vapor into methane and carbon dioxide. Um, and the thing about water vapor is it's highly variable too. Not only does it impact almost the entire spectrum, and here I'm showing the influence of water vapor as you go from effectively no water vapor, which you might find in the winter at high altitude, um, uh, to very heavy uh, water vapor. So uh, 50 precipital millimeters means if you condense the atmosphere, it would be 50 millimeters or five centimeters deep. So that would be a strong absorbing atmosphere. And then you also have very dry atmospheres and you want to be able to look through the atmosphere and compensate for these effects to answer your questions if it relates to the surface. So water vapor is important to be able to characterize and uh, compensate for. Um, so I was fortunate again, I arrived at, at JPL, I think circa 1986 and Avaris was starting to fly. Um, got involved with the program, got involved with, uh, again, one of my mentors was uh, Jim Connell, who since passed away, and Jack Margolis in this list. Greg Vane, of course, uh, wrote the average proposal. Um, so we realized right away we, we had leverage to measure water vapor and we're going to need to to compensate for it. So this was very early article. Again, this work was done from 1980s, measurements made, I think, with average in 1987. Um, and we were just using a simple ratio in and out of a water band to try to assess water vapor. But there's an early image I had to grab this from a digitized publication. I don't know how many of you actually have digital files on your computer that extend back to the early, early 80s. Um, I, I don't have so many, but some of these documents did get digitized and so I could find this one. So this is a map. There's Ivan Paw Playa, the Clark Range. Um, so it's low altitude, high altitude, topography, and it's hard to see the color bar. This originally was in color. Um, we had more water vapor down in the valley, less water vapor up on the mountain driven by path length. So right away we could have the sensitivity to measure water vapor and we needed it because we wanted to suppress the water vapor to see the surface cleanly. Um, that went on. I, I wrote this article um, in one of the average workshops. Um, didn't make it into the journal literature, but it's out there. Um, uh, working on an algorithm to get water vapor here, realizing that we needed to not only assess the water vapor, but comp realize that when it's over green vegetation, that there's leaf water, liquid water, same molecule, different phase, overlapping absorption. We wanted to solve for both at the same time. So 
Um, by this point, we've gone beyond simple ratios to spectral fitting, and there's a fit between um, average measured uh, radiance and mod trend modeled radiance, uh, also allowing for the presence of leaf water. And this uh, two locations, this is Rogers Dry Lake, and this is a water vapor map and plume moving through the field. Apologize for the same color. I wasn't able to find that. Um, but it showed two things. Water vapor is highly variable and it's moving through time, which is another factor. It means that's another important point for, for all these gases, water vapor in particular, is that you know a single measurement at one instant in time, especially for water vapor, is not true at the next instant in time. So not only do you need to know the water vapor to correct for it, you need to know the right water vapor. You need to know the water vapor for that spectrum that you can't use radius on or some other method. Um, and I'll add just a little bit more. Not only do you need to know the total column, but you need to know the total column in the path of that spectrum. And that spectrum is illuminated from the sun to the ground and the ground to the instrument. So that's, you need to know water vapor in that specific path if you're gonna correct for it. So uh, fortunately, um, when you measure the whole spectrum, you have that leverage. You have the water vapor signature from the path that you care about, which is from the sun to the surface, to the thing you're interested in, to your instrument. So uh, we were able to come up with algorithms and, and take advantage of that to derive the water vapor on a spectrum by spectrum basis or pixel by pixel basis. Um, and then we can use that to understand water vapor, or we can use that to compensate for water vapor to look at the other signatures on the surface of the earth. Um, and this is a map Again, because we were compensating for vegetation at the same time, this is showing our mapping of surface canopy water and water vapor um, in a local area where there's some alfalfa fields. So there's a nice alfalfa field where we could map the water in the canopy that has relevance for ecosystems um, and do a better job of accurately measuring or deriving the water vapor in the atmosphere. So we'll get to CO2 and methane, but it began here uh, with water vapor. And then I took that further when I was working on my PhD to solve for all three phases of water. The last one indicated we had water vapor and leaf water. Well, water also exists as a frozen uh, compound on the surface of the earth. So I had this nice average data set uh, over um, Mount Rainier where we have all three phases, ice, liquid water and melting snow and then vegetation and water vapor. And uh, we have characterized the liquid and solids with the complex refractive index. And then we use the rate of transfer for the water vapor. And we could go from this nice image of Mount Rainier to know a map where ice is red, liquid water is green and water vapor is blue. When the snow is melting, it's yellow, it's got red and green and you're seeing the blue down below. So uh, again, uh, water vapor, we got a pretty good handle on it pretty pretty early um, in the, the need for Avaris. And it was interesting in and of itself here. Liquid, when snow is melting is a topic of interest as well. So I think that's the last one on water vapor. Um, but that's where it began for me. Other questions? Uh, just sorry to interrupt. Um, I don't know if you see it on your screen. There's a little bar at the bottom. It says either stop sharing or hide. I think you can hide it. Got it. Thank you. Sorry, don't uh, All right. So you've got, I didn't realize you guys were seeing that, but yes, that's hide. I can stop there for questions uh, if there are any, um, or continue on to the next gases. All right, I'll continue and we'll pick up questions at the end. Uh, so um, we began with water vapor, but of course we realized there were other gases. Um, and again, this is just removing the water vapor. This is what's left. You don't really get access to this carbon dioxide at the middle water vapor band, but the, the other ones, there's methane for you, uh, carbon dioxide, ozone. Um, so I dove into this in the, the late 90s with Avaris. We had some scenes, it was clear. There was interest in the late 90s. People were worried, beginning to talk about carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases and uh, worries about uh, climate change, global warming. Um, and NASA was interested in were there, were there methods to get at carbon dioxide different than what had been proposed. So. I had this scene from uh, near uh, over Pasadena, in fact, uh, 
this is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory um, right there. These are mountains, Mount Wilson. This is Pasadena, Post Bowls over here, Lake Avenue, Altadena. So nice day to sit close to home. Uh, so I started to say, well, how can, can we use the water vapor like methods to get at carbon dioxide? Um, and then could I talk to NASA management and say, you know, you can get access to carbon dioxide in these solar reflectant bands. You don't necessarily need to use the bands that are very stronger, that are at longer wavelengths, which uh, can be tricky. Um, so I took a spectrum from Mount Wilson and a spectrum from Pasadena, and I formed a ratio and said, look, you know, there's, there's CO2. So clearly CO2 path length concentration is changing because the path length is changing. The distance from the sun to down in the valley to our instrument is longer than the distance from uh, uh, the sun to, to the Mount Wilson area to the instrument. So you're going to see a difference in path length. There's less CO2 molecules in the shorter path. So you ought to see a difference in the spectral absorption. So that's true. And I tested that with the ratio. And I ran Modtran with different CO2, or it may even been Lotran. Again, I started before there was a Modtran. Um, Lotran 7, I think. 20,000 lines of Fortran 4. Uh, and I think in those days, I had to go into the code and figure out how to modify the, the CO2 levels. But I showed Modtran could be used to model different amounts of CO2. It was wonderful to have that resource. And then I could build a similar spectral fitting algorithms to what we did for water vapor, but now looking at the CO2 bands. So um, this is a fit between an average measured spectrum, uh, the Modtran model that I was using, and the residual, and solve for every spectrum, and then produce a map of CO2 um, uh, concentration uh, from uh, the same scene. So we, we have lower values at uh, higher altitude and higher values at low altitude. So there was good sensitivity for um, carbon dioxide. Even though the atmospheric spectroscopists at the time, they really liked high resolution. That, you know, Reinhard Beer was there, they're working on uh, the tropospheric emission spectrometer. They wanted 10th wave number resolution to resolve the spectral lines, the very fine structure. Uh, and there are questions you can answer when you can do that. Then they sort of there was a conventional wisdom that you could never do anything useful in the atmosphere with coarser spectral resolution at the five nanometer level. And, and I bumped right into that. There, there was the same conventional wisdom that spectrum didn't make sense, that Landsat really gave you all you needed um, in that era. And again, it, it's a common problem in science, even though we're supposed to be open. Uh, once we learn how to do something with Landsat or with a high resolution spectrometer, we tend not to want to change and, and that, uh, that, have, that has been my career bumping into those. So anyway, here I showed that, that with 10 nanometers, we actually could see uh, CO2 when working at the band level. The other thing I realized is that you'd like to know carbon dioxide over the ocean. Well, the ocean is dark at these wavelengths. So why, how could you do that? Well, we had not flown Avaris um, over the ocean in a big circle uh, and captured the sun glint. So there's sun glint off the ocean because of the Brewster angle, um, and you get uh, uh, a strong signal that's modulated by the waves. So I said, well, maybe we could work in the sun glint uh, for CO2. So this was a sun glint image from Avaris. There's uh, pulling off spectra outside the glint um, and in the glint. And there was a, an estimate of CO2 using this fitting method over the glint spot. So you could, I showed you could. You could work over dark targets, dark water targets for CO2 and get quite a nice signal um, if you could point your instrument at the, at the sun glint. Um, so this was all work sort of in 1999 and, and, and 2000. I, I did get it into the Avaris workshop in 2001. But again, because NASA was interested, um, I put in a request to the JPL leadership, Rod Zeiger, who was head of their science director, and Diane Evans, who was the deputy. Um, and I said, look, we could go after uh, carbon dioxide in the solar reflected um, in the 1650 and 2000 nanometer region. Um, and we could even work over water with sun glint. So I put that request in. That request for internal funding to write a proposal was accepted. Um, and I was a co-I early on, but later on, because I, I was mostly working on the surface, I stepped away from that. But I ran some of the early uh, studies on um, what OCO might look like. 
my leaning would have it be a coarser resolution spectrometer, but you know, I, I was willing to, the atmosphere team uh, knew what they wanted to do and they proceeded uh, to move towards a finer spectral resolution, coarser spatial resolution. Um, but I think we're coming full circle um, now, but that's what we, uh, that's what happened in, uh, in the early 2000s. And that led to OCO again, which uh, tragically failed to reach orbit, but we were able to uh, then rebuild it in OCO2 and then our OCO3 with spare parts. Um, so uh, that's a long uh, history and, and how imaging spectrometers played a row and uh, played a role in, in, in these important observations. And uh, these are imaging spectrometers though. They're more spectrometer than imaging, but they, they do have a spatial domain and a spectral domain. So uh, that was a, a neat result and, and sort of part of my history in the early carbon dioxide world. Um, so anyway, I was looking through my chart, said, well, there's carbon dioxide elsewhere. I, I would share it with you guys. Um, it turns out I'm also a co-I on CRISM, uh, which was launched in 2005 uh, to Mars. Um, and I was looking mostly at the uh, signatures and dust of ice at the polar caps. Mars does have both ice polar caps, and then, then they're, in the winters, they're covered with carbon dioxide, but I was looking in the, in the uh, summer seasons, and there you can see the ice absorptions from uh, um, a chrism spectrum from the polar cap. So an imaging spectrometer, uh, my connection is it's a science co-I, and we also provided the uh, gratings for, for this spectrometer. Um, and uh, uh, and it's still in orbit. Uh, the SWIR has stopped working, but the Wiener is still working. And uh, Scott Murchie of APL with the uh, PI, and there I am doing calibrate last minute calibration below the spacecraft um, at, in Colorado. So why did I show this? Well, I think it's, it's carbon dioxide again. It's just imaging spectrometer again. It has JPL gratings um, on the science team. So one of the other things they wanted to understand about CRISM after it arrived and opened its uh, cover, which was in 2006, um, uh, was uh, how was the spectral calibration? Well, I said, well, we can look at the carbon dioxide lines. I can model them with the Martian atmosphere and we can see how they fit uh, with CRISM spectra. So um, I think the blue is a model CO2, change the concentration, it's different. I actually use ModTran, but I had to, take it over pretty heavily to simulate the uh, atmospheric concentrations in the Martian atmosphere. And there's a chrism spectrum. You can see this, the three-fingered CO2 around two microns, same one we have in the Earth's atmosphere, though very different concentrations. So uh, right off, I said, you know, there's a bit of a spectral shift between what chrism is seeing as carbon dioxide at Mars compared to when we measured it in a laboratory. Uh, but I said, we can, we can uh, assess that shift and then apply spectral calibration corrections uh, to, to do a better job of CRISM on orbit calibration. Um, use the same sort of fitting technique that uh, I had developed um, for Avaris with CRISM. And here's uh, the residual from the red is measured CRISM, the green is my heavily modified ModTran to simulate the Martian atmosphere and the residual. Um, so we could estimate how much CO2 in the atmosphere, which wasn't the real question. The real question was, what's the spectral calibration in the Martian orbit as it went on to look at uh, surface uh, minerals and other properties at Mars. So I ran that algorithm for every cross-track element. CRISM had 600 cross-track uh, elements or 600 spectrometers. And as we know, uh, this term smile and keystone grew very early with push moon imaging spectrometers. And, CRISM had pretty significant uh, smile and keystone, and uh, there was a shift um, from the pre-lab calibration, which is this weak line, and the, the in-flight estimation. So um, uh, that shift was quite a few nanometers. CRISM has a lot of smile, much more than Hyperion. It's more than 100% that the spectral calibration at the center to the edge is much more than one spectral channel. So we were able to provide this information, again, carbon dioxide imaging spectrometer, uh, another way to use it um, in this case to uh, update the calibration of a, an imaging spectrometer and around Mars. Um, so that's a little bit, and I really 
on this talk, I'm just doing the very early stuff, the stuff I've been involved with. There's lots more uh, work uh, sort of overlapping in this time frame towards the end and, and going further. And I'll show them some of the papers. Um, you know, Phil Dennison did a lot on carbon dioxide and quite a few others have looked at and Andrew Thorpe and others and even more currently with Arbus Next Gen. But that was just a little bit of, since this is about the history that's some early history reaching back, uh, maybe just before some of you were even, even born. Oh, so on to methane. How am I going to talk about that? It's about right. So again, methane's an absorber. It's not as strong as water vapor or CO2, so it's more sporty. Um, but there's a nice methane absorption out here. This is shown at the band level. There's also a weak signal in here, um, but we've largely focused on this one. And here, um, I had some involvement, but uh, one of my thesis advisors was in there very early ahead of me. So again, this is the, how the CO2 looks um, in a radiant spectrum. Again, we kind of compensate for CO2 and water to get CO2 right, it turns out, or especially water. Um, but um, uh, people, again, I still associate with, uh, Dar Roberts was one of my advisors, um, Andrew Thorpe. Um, has led this and is in my group at JPL right now, leading it. Phil Dennison's at University of Utah. He was there very early. Eliza Bradley did a lot of early important work, but has moved on. I'm not quite sure where uh, Chris Funk is. But these are uh, early, uh, early work um, led by this group and um, presented at one of the Hisperi meetings, which I chaired um, in the last decade. So uh, we were collecting average data for various objectives um, in various places um, in the early 2000s. And this is a data set um, off the coast of Santa Barbara uh, where we had some sun glint and uh, also there, uh, there's our big methane seeps there. So there's just natural seeping methane that have names like Trilogy and Horseshoe. Um, and uh, Andrew and Dar and Eliza and Ira Leifer was involved uh, quickly realized that, yeah, we could see methane at 10 nanometers uh, with avarice. And Jack Margolis was involved as well. And Jack, I've known, again, I, you know, he's still around, um, you know, since 87 and 88 when I came to JPL. And he kept saying, you've got to do finer spectral resolution, but we kept saying we can do it at 10 nanometers. And we've continued to work at 10 and now five uh, with pretty good success because there we get more photons, um, in the bigger band, and that's important for some of the questions when you want to localize your source. Um, so Andrew and Dar and Phil and Eliza and others um, used some of these early average measurements. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, this one. Okay. Um, to look at uh, both uh, um, sources in aquatic environments and terrestrial. Um, uh, uh, sources is this methane coming out of the Moss Landing power plant, um, uh, probably not fully combusted. And then there was a, a leak uh, down, in, I think, at this storage field as well. Really early, published in 2011, um, but with data sets collected before that. So this was the early methane work. Um, in 2018, again, this is Avaris Classic. Avaris Next Gen doesn't exist, but we took it off the ER2, put it on a twin otter, and flew it very low um, to do some tests about uh, capturing methane over terrestrial targets. So La Brea tar pits, Inglewood oil field. And we showed again, even with 10 nanometer uh, spectral resolution, we could see. Uh, see methane um, with Avaris next gen. This way, this is Avaris Classic, uh, the 10 nanometer instrument. Um, and then looking at, zooming in those terrestrial sources, we could see them uh, with match filtered methods um, with pretty good fidelity um, from these early, early case studies. Um, and then another one down at a, a leak at a storage field. And this group was working on, now that we can detect it, let's try to get it to 
So you want to detect it, measure it, and then you'd like to be able to look at the emission rates, which means you have to say something about wind speed, but uh, trying to quantify it in terms of part per, parts per meter, uh, parts per million per kilometer column uh, with a match filter method. So once you've, you've got access to a new observable, then you want to begin to quantify it and use it to answer both science and applied questions and methane uh, came about in this time frame. Uh, I also looked at uh, marine sources. Uh, we responded with Avers Classic to the Gulf oil spill. And of course there we're primarily looking at oil, but we we're flying a lot of uh, oil fields with uh, uh, drilling platforms and extraction platforms. And some of them were leaking CO2. So uh, again, work of uh, Dar and, uh, and Andrew and that team uh, showed that we could map uh, methane. And there's a beautiful image. Again, we were flying on the ER2, but fairly low with seven meter samples, but a beautiful plume of methane coming off that oil rig in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, again, showing that even at 10 nanometers, we have leverage of methane. Um, jumping from there, uh, a colleague at JPL, Andrew Aubrey, who has since left to form a company to look at methane from a different perspective, uh, was trying to build on this with Andrew Thorpe and others and uh, show the oil industry that this was a method for detecting leaks and understanding um, what was going on in their oil fields in regard to methane. So there's something called the Rocky Mountain Oil Field Testing Center, or MOTC, is, is what I came to know it. I had to go find that acronym. And this was happening in sort of 2012 when Average Next Gen was just, this is one of the first things it did. Um, once we finished building it. Now, Average Next Gen has higher signal noise and it has five nanometer sampling, which is a, a bit better uh, for, uh, especially for these gases, which have uh, lots of lines in small band regions of the spectrum. So this was actually work that, that, that I did um, quickly because Andrew asked me uh, uh, was to use a very simple method, a continuous airplane band ratio um, and look at the Ramatsi data and show that Avers Next Gen could see these controlled leak experiments. More work has been done with those data and, and they've been published and quantified, but I actually did something similar to what I did with uh, um, CO2 and, and uh, water vapor is, is quickly go in and out of where I thought the plume was, look at the ratio, see the signature, realize it was pretty small. And so maybe just a continuum of triplet band ratio would let us map that plume and so I did that and, and suppressed the background. And there's a methane plume from this controlled release at Ramatsi. And that was important early work that was shown to the sponsors and, and again, began building this uh, capability for Abris to measure methane. Now, I, before I go into the next one, I, I've left out a couple of topics, which I realize just been busy, didn't get in. Um, we did a big methane campaign with Christian Frankenberger and David Thompson, uh, put an algorithm on Avers Next Gen so we could do real-time methane. There's a few examples I realized I could have shown, but we don't have so much time. Um, so I'll just summarize those. We did a big flight at uh, Four Corners, and that's a proceeding of the National Academy paper. So some of these will be in papers that you could follow up on. Because um, they knew we knew there was a methane, a big methane source in that region of Four Corners in the United States, but nobody knew what the real source was. So we flew Avers Next Gen with an algorithm on the plane to do real-time methane mapping that David Thompson wrote and installed just before the campaign, um, and that was incredibly uh, successful. And we showed that the methane was largely due to oil infrastructure. Though we found some coal mines, we found some natural sources of methane, and we found some leaking pipelines. Uh, we were able to call in leaking pipelines because you go to a place, there's no oil infrastructure, but there's a plume of methane. And we went there on the ground and saw this plume and it was obviously associated with a pipeline that had broken. So we let the oil company know that the, the gas was leaking there and they came out and fixed it. So it was nice to see that get used. So another thing I'll just uh, talk about is that at this, after that, I don't remember the exact date, but of course there was the giant leak in Los Angeles at the Liso Canyon. And uh, that was a huge methane plume. We flew Avers over it and mapped that plume. Uh, 
Um, and also, uh, kindly, our colleagues at Goddard were able to point Hyperion at that plume. And David Thompson was able to analyze those, analyze those data and show that we could even map methane with Hyperion, 10 nanometer low signal noise, far away from its uh, original sun synchronous orbit. But we got the first detection of a methane plume from space. And David Thompson's lead author on that. It's in the list of papers. So before I go any further, I wanted to acknowledge those were things I could have included but didn't get into this presentation. Um, so again, uh, uh, greenhouse gas point source mapping with imaging spectroscopy in the V-square, it's very powerful. This is, in fact, this is the methane plume from Aliso Canyon from Atlas Classic. Um, but here are some uh, estimates of CO2 per hour and methane per hour from average next-gen measurements. So we, we really know that if you want to see the plumes, you need high signal noise to that. Coarser spectral resolution is better. And our algorithms are getting better to work at the sort of the band level rather than the, the fine structure level. And uh, um, that's led to some, some interesting choices and some, again, some important papers. Here's, I guess I did get the papers here. Um, Space based remote spectroscopy at Lisa Canyon, that's Thompson's paper. Christian Frankenberger, uh, Frankenberg at, uh, he's at Caltech, but this is that Four Corners, proceeds the National Academy. And then Riley's been working a wide range of campaigns with Average Next Gen and their sister sensor, GAO, um, and that's the Nature paper. So again, um, the spectroscopy, very important for CO2 and methane, and it's recognized as such by being published in some of very prestigious uh, uh, science journals. So I'm going to move towards a wrap up. Um, Lots of nice outcomes. Uh, one is that that Riley, who was at JPL, has left and formed a, it's a nonprofit uh, called Carbon Mapper. And I invite you to look at their website. It's very, very good. But they've come back and teamed with JPL for us to build the Carbon Plume Mapper, which will be a space imaging spectrometer with 30 meter resolution, five nanometer sampling, very, very high signal noise to detect methane and CO2 plumes. Um, it will also measure the whole spectrum. So other things that can be uh, measured with it were teamed with the, the, a company called Planet as well. And the idea is eventually this will grow uh, to a constellation that will uh, be able to help monitor um, uh, methane and CO2 and help people mitigate it. it. Methane is really important for mitigation because it has a fairly short lifetime in the Earth atmosphere. So if you could stop Injecting to this atmosphere, it will uh, dissipate, and that could take, I think, a third of a degree C off of uh, warming, uh, the warming forcing in the Earth's atmosphere. A CO2, uh, unfortunately, has a much longer lifetime. So if you stopped all CO2 going to the atmosphere, you're still in uh, for 100 years um, before that, or more, I think, before that. And we're using at JPL our very best technologies. Um, to, uh, to build this next generation space imaging spectrometer. Um, so just, uh, I think I've shared these and I'm glad to share them again. Lots of publications of this work, track record evidence. Um, um, I'm not including any of mine, which are more in conference papers, but Dr. Roberts did remote sensing environment in 2010 on methane. Uh, Eliza Bradley, Andrew Thorpe, uh, deeply involved as he was working on his PhD in this area and has since joined my group at JPL. Um, so this is also lovely. Uh, well, I guess that stayed in. I, I meant to. So I'm sorry, this is this next one is a little bit harder to read, but again, it continues uh, all the way to 2001, though I didn't get this fully scaled uh, for this. But again, the rate of papers um, is growing dramatically um, in 2018, 19, 2020, looking at methane and CO2. And I think these papers were selected to ones that really use the average uh, next gen and average classic measurements. There are other papers, of course, with uh, elsewhere, but uh, this is a rapidly growing field as it relates to the current uh, um, climate change crisis that we face. Um, nice. Uh, <clears throat> example of that publication trend, which I think is good evidence. A um, couple of websites, there's uh, methane 
jpl.nasa.gov. And of course, there's a, um, at the average next gen site, there's greenhouse gas mapping. You're welcome to look at those. We have data sets and uh, other information that you can uh, use to assess different algorithms um, with uh, methane and CO2 at these levels. So I'm going to try to wrap up so there's time for uh, conclusions, but I will say something else that has kept me very busy, including with a science team meeting this week on Monday and Tuesday. I didn't have as much time to prepare for this as I would have liked, but again, the Earth surface mineral dust source is an imaging spectrometer that I'm PI for that's uh, planned to launch on May 1st this year. We're going to look at minerals in the air land regions of the planet with advanced spectroscopy and address some questions related to radiative forcing, but these data will be available to everybody through the uh, um, land processes stack, and there's lots of uh, additional value, including methane and CO2 um, that can come from these spectroscopic measurements. And again, because it's what I'm focused on these days, here's a picture. Um, that's the optical design. That's what we said it should look like in CAD, and here it is coming together at JPL. And it's going into its final thermal max cycle and again, getting ready to deliver to the Cape and launch um, in early May. I'm also pleased to report it's very well aligned. I've been clear that what we're doing is flying a lot of spectrometers in these push broom instruments, whether it's Hyperion, which had 250 cross track spectrometers, or Chrism had 600. And we really want them to have the same calibration. So Hyperion had a fair bit of smile or frown, Chrism had a lot. But we really nailed it with a mid. It has 1,240 cross track spectrometers. And they all have the same spectral calibration to, to less than 2% of a channel. It has effectively no smile and, and no keystone. Um, and this enables the most, uh, you know, the most sophisticated algorithms. Um, so I'm pleased by that. I said it was important to do, but sometimes saying something, you also want to be able to show it's possible to do it. So we have shown it's possible to do it. Now with this and another spectrometer that we're going to deliver to UCH, which has a squib alignment called CWIS2. So uh, I think I'm going to stop there. Um, I haven't covered everything. It's not possible. Left a few things out. I tried to allude to those, um, but I'm glad to answer questions um, uh, in regard to what I presented or other things related to this class of instrumentation. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Rob. This was a great presentation. Really appreciate your time uh, for this. I have a couple of questions in the chat um, that we can ask, but if anybody would like to ask um, anything before I get started with those, please feel free to chime in. We have cameras on now, probably with low Yeah. <laughs> All right, people are shy, so I will start. So this was from uh, Rob Bartnick. Um, he has the question, so Stefan, Linton, and others talk about tipping point systems involving methane release, i.e. permafrost, um, calthrates, um, methanogens increasing suddenly. Could Avaris be used to assess ma major methane release? and be included in climate energy models to assess tipping points. I think maybe carbon mapper might um, might be the Yeah, no, that's a great question. Of. And it's tricky as you as you go to high latitudes, uh, the forests are dark in this range and there's not as much sun. But we've been very fortunate to fly Everest Next Gen as part of the NASA Above campaign, which is Arctic Boreal Forest Experiment. And, and we've actually, uh, there are papers out there showing that we can uh, detect methane um, uh, localized leaks associated, this seems to be mostly associated with aquatic systems, like you'll have um, small uh, ponds in the forest and, and there's a lot, there's methane coming out, cooking around the edge where there's, there's the vegetation and it's in the summer. So I think, yes, uh, this method can capture methane sources, even at high latitudes in some of those uh, potential tipping point sources. Um, it, it could play a role in Certainly localizing, and again, carbon blue map where it's the space born incarnation of average next gen effectively. Great, thank you. Um, so another question uh, regarding lessons learned from Avaris, how can they be applied to future space born imaging spectrometers? Yeah, okay, so there's three things. First of all, um, what I say, signal noise matters a lot. So build the system that has 
ability to collect a lot of a lot of photons and that you get you know cornered by physics you're in an orbit you know with only so much integration time so that feeds back again spatial and spectral resolution and second um you know so high signal noise and then um low artifacts so try to keep the smile the keystone those other things really try to keep those low collect good spectra and then build a stable instrument so high signal noise um, low artifacts and, and make it stable. If it's stable, then you can calibrate it. If it's not stable, I don't care what you do. You can put an more calibrator on it, but you end up just chasing your tail trying to keep the instrument. So uh, those are my top three is you get the signal noise, lower the artifacts and, and make sure you pay attention to stability. Um, and, and then I think those are the lessons that I've learned because I started out with Average Classic, which had low signal noise Poor uh, artifact performance, though not too bad, and it was very unstable. It just changed every time you, you, you turned it. So um, I learned those. Fortunately, we were able to fix Avaris uh, Classic, and, and now it's, it pretty much meets all those requirements in Avaris Next Gen by design best. Great. Yeah, thank you. That, I like how you condensed that down to three things. Um, how can instruments such as Avaris, another question, how can instruments such as Avaris or other imaging spectrometers be integrated with other satellite missions that measure CO2, methane, such as Sentinel-5P uh, or the upcoming CO2M mission? Well, it's very natural and, and obvious that both Avaris and Carbon Mapper are going to see the localized sources. So we can attribute specifically, okay, it's this wellhead that's leaking. And those, those big ongoing methane and CO2 and future CO2 um, give us regional and sometimes localized regional uh, hotspots that you know, there's a lot of methane here, a lot of CO2 here, um, but you might want to refine that and say, okay, it's this specific wellhead, this refinery, this uh, pipeline that's leaking. So they complement each other wonderfully because um, of course the higher spatial resolution ones um, need to be targeted. We need to know where to look. So uh, there's a, a, a complementary that the, the coarser spatial resolution that are giving sort of global, regional, and quasi-local indications can then guide where you want to point your airborne assets or your spaceborne assets to to really uh, pick off the uh, uh, the localized sources. So then you can mitigate them. I'm not hearing you at the moment, and I hope that's not me. I had a cat meowing outside the door, so I'm using. So I can't. I can't hear you. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Can you hear me? I can now. Okay. Yeah, I had to mute for a moment. Um, so Durbin Keeler asks, "Do you quantify the uncertainty in methane detection in any sort of formal way? I.e., do you represent the uncertainty in your estimates or results?" Yes, and in fact, if you look at the, I showed some of the early work where there was less of that done, but if you look at some of the, the more recent um, journal cars, the Proceedings of National Academy, Dave's paper um, on the methane leak in, uh, uh, I remember exactly which journal, and Riley's paper in Nature, they're absolutely quantified. Uh, their, their units put on them, not just simple detection, but measurement, and then quantifiable uncertainties. The IMAC DOAS is the method that, that Andrew Thorpe and, and Christian uh, Frankenberg. So I would refer to those journal articles that it's absolutely quantified and with uncertainties. Okay. Um, another question, this is a little bit uh, specific on a, a type of field. So um, Rob, can you please share your thoughts on what would be needed to quantify methane emitted from rice fields? Um, I think these spectroscopic methods can quantify that. Um, and I think we've even done it in the, with Avaris Next Gen in the Central Valley, California, where a lot of rice is, is grown. And we've looked at actually dairies are another big source. So again, a lot of these papers talk about the segments. There's agricultural sources, including dairies and rice fields. There's um, landfills turn out to be a big one. Then there's the oil infrastructure, both the extraction part and then the, the trans, uh, transmission with pipelines and, uh, and power plants. So um, there's a number of very nice papers that break that out and, and rice fields and agriculture. There is leverage, um, and we've seen evidence for it. They aren't quite as nice localized plumes, which are 
easier, but uh, we, we've been showing with even with average next gen that we can see, um, you know, the localized sources from things like rice agriculture. And I guess just a, a reminder, I'm sure a lot of people on this um, webinar know um, Averse data is uh, publicly available. Um, you guys have a great site for being able to download um, past collects and and certainly uh, look at these types of features over um, the, the the objects that Rob was just discussing. You know, landfills, rice um, fields, where you know Averse is obviously an aerial instrument, and you don't have necessarily global coverage, but um, many of these areas have have that type of coverage, so you can um, certainly work with the data. Uh, that's been collected in the past. Uh, Rob, do you have any comments on that or just, um, you know, how people can- Yeah, no, absolutely. We're, all our data is, is publicly available under NASA's Earth Science Data Policy, and I want to give NASA great credit. I think that policy has caused other nations to follow it, and that's yeah. that's good for us all, and NASA is really pushing open science right now, so we're, we're also working to open source all our algorithms and everything uh, so that other people can reproduce the results with those algorithms, so. Yeah, no, uh, reach out. You should be able to get access to the average data through the website. Great. Um, I see we're almost up to, up to time. I have one more question in here. Um, can the new satellite based multi and multi spectral instruments with higher signal to noise but lower spectral resolution be better than Avris and EMIT? to detect more dispersed, lower concentration methane sources. So, I mean, I can be controversial. I, I, I have not found much value in multispectral and that's just it. And you can go ahead and try to prove me wrong, but I would I'd take a spectrum any day. And I don't know what you, lower resolution is coarser resolution or you mean finer resolution? Finer resolution, there's this trade between the spectral resolution and the signal noise. And as it gets finer, you get fewer photons, your signal noise, no matter how good your detector, you can have a zero noise detector, you still get shot noise. And, and so it's a, it's a tricky trade. Um, it seems right now that we can do really well, um, you know, in the, probably the, the five nanometer, maybe down to one nanometer spectral range. So if you go from five to one, you just got one fifth of photons and that's pretty ugly. And then you need to satisfy stability and artifacts. So, um, yeah, I don't think multispectral. You got to you have to have a whole spectrum because you need to. As I tried to point out with both the water vapor, CO two to some extent, you have to solve for all the background confusers. And so the multispectral does very poorly at that. I'll be, you know, you if you've got six bands, there's more than six things on planet Earth that are modulating those bands. You can't solve for more than six things. So. The spectrum lets you really get the background right. Is it vegetation? Is it carbonate? Is it kaolinite? Is it something that can confuse you and mimic what you're after, in this case, methane? So if you have a whole spectrum, you can solve for both what you want to find, which is the methane or CO2, and the background. And the background includes water vapor in this case. So, um, you know, again, my entire career has shown me and continues to make a living at, at spectroscopy. And, and wonderfully, the technology makes it easier and easier to build spectrometers. So, and I think, you know, we should be moving into an era where more and more spectrometers are flying. And I think that that's coming, coming true. And it's a lot of money. So it must, not, not must, but it's, there's good evidence that it works. Yeah, thanks so much, Rob. Um, I'm very excited by um, Carbon Mapper and all of the other instruments that are coming. Yeah, I mean, SBG, Europe has Chime, India, China. Um, there's a lot of spectrometers coming real fast. And that with the LR, Prisma is already up there. DSIS is already up there. Um, uh, and then Hisui from Japan. So, yeah, no, I think that the case is fine. The tipping point, someone used tipping point earlier. I think it's been a tipping point in the, the realization that spectrometers really do make the most sense and the technology allows them. And it was not that way when I began. I, I can't tell you how many times I was assured it was a waste of time to measure a spectrum. Yeah, I have one last question and this is for me. Um, so I worked on the, the DSIS program and um, you, so on the ISS, there's obviously challenges. Um, calibration is always a challenge with any kind of imaging spectrometer. Um, 
how do you see calibration, the, cal the community coming together to calibrate all of these various hyperspectral sensors? Do you think it's just everybody for themselves or is it, is it kind of a, a network that helps all these instruments be calibrated? Well, that's, yeah, so I'll be controversial again. Uh, calibration doesn't matter to me at all unless it matters for what I'm trying to do. It's not an end. A lot of people think calibration is an end. And I will argue it's not, it's a means to an end. Mm -hmm. Calibrate as well as you need to to answer your science or application. So I would, I would tend to let the community sort that out. And it, this ties back to the uncertainty question. You know, if you want to get your uncertainties, that's going to require some level of calibration. So you need to calibrate that well. So I guess I wouldn't let calibration drive the story. It, we're coming into a wonderful world where there are things like um, um, RadCalNet and uh, mm -hmm. pseudo invariant calibration targets that. The planet Earth is offering an awful lot of great strategies for calibration. So number one, spectra calibration. If you measure a spectrum, you're done. You show me any spectrum of the atmosphere of the Earth that contains the atmosphere, and I can do spectral calibration. No one should ever bother flying an onboard spectral calibrator, sorry, <laughs> and or really worry about it. It's done. If you look at oxygen, you look at water vapor, you know, it's just there. So that's easy. Spatial calibration is done too. Just look at a city and get a, a base map where everything's located, and then you can figure out your response function to your camera model. So the harder one is radiometric. There, the beauty of uh, the RadCalNet and the pseudo invariant target. So you can probably do your radiometric. It has no onboard calibrator, doesn't have a shutter. We don't even close, we collect the dark from the dark side of the earth. So we want simple systems. Onboard calibrators are very tricky. Uh, you end up worrying, is your onboard calibrator changing more than your instrument? Which one's changing? They cost a lot if you put them in orbit. So I think we're gonna move to the world where that's less important. Maybe some simple ones like illumination coverage makes sense, but calibration, let it, let it, don't let it be the ends, let it be the means. And there's lots of tools. Spectral is handled, spatial is handled just by default. And then radiometric, RadCalNet. I'm a big fan of RadCalNet and pseudo invariant yeah. targets. Those are Beautiful. And there's another rule I have is fly as you calibrate, calibrate as you fly, which goes with test as you fly, fly as you test. That one ball calibrators never produce the signal you want. You need this calibration signal that is the one that's consistent with the Earth's radiances. So that's again the beauty of RadCalNet and Sudanvera target. Those are calibration targets that are consistent with what Earth is offering us to measure. So that, that was a little bit of a hobby horse. <laughs> no, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, so we'll wrap up here. I did put my email address in the chat box if you have any additional questions or um, uh, feedback, that sort of thing. Um, there's also a link to the GRSS YouTube page where this presentation will be posted. Um, thank you so much, Rob. We really appreciate your time. Um, we also appreciate all of our attendees and the questions that you have, um, these types of encounters help us promote this community. And I'm really excited to see um, a lot of advances in the hyperspectral world to come. And Rob, it looks like you have something to say. No, no, I was just giving a thumbs up. It sounds good to me. Okay, very good. Well, thank you everybody. And uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Appreciate it. All right, take care everyone. Bye-bye.